This episode is sponsored by Blue Apron. Use the link in the description to sign up. Hey, Jeff. What? Could you record this, all of the footage for the this game for me? What? And I need to also need uh, every other Zelda game except for... Actually, I just need all of them. Uh, can you edit some videos? I have a bunch. Check, check on my uh, ferrets for me. Why? I think one of them's a little too chunky right now. Why? My dogs are really bored also. Why? They need to go to, to, to get a bath. Uh, could you could you take care of that for me? What are you even talking? Really having a, cur a craving for a skim sp skettios. Uh, could you get to the store and get some skettios? I would like to cook. I like to cook together with them. Get the ones that are cooking waffles. Let me turn them on and really like to cook this thing. I'm also really thirsty and I'm kind of running out of water. What if I did none of those things and just played this game instead? With Zelda Breath of the Wild on the horizon and the newly announced Nintendo Switch, I think it's pretty safe to say that we're all pretty excited to see what we're gonna get from Nintendo in the future. But in the meantime, we have to keep ourselves busy and there's one game I've been meaning to talk about for a while. In a video I did on Zelda bootlegs, I pretty shortly covered a game called Zelda Parallel Worlds, with the full intention of possibly coming back to it. Zelda Parallel Worlds is a hack slash overhaul mod for Zelda A Link to the Past, and has been considered the pinnacle when it comes to Link to the Past ROM hacks, or at least a bar that's set pretty high when it comes to ROM hacks in general. It's got a new story, a new overworld, and... SEXY BLONDE HAIR! I actually even have a reproduction cart of the game for the Super Nintendo! It's so cool, oh my god, it's blue! Well, here we go. So second chances and all that. Great, I'll grab my stuff! Thanks, Link. The game begins with the story, which is remarkably similar to A Link to the Past. There's apparently two different worlds, and they're somehow linked. One that's potentially a harsh environment that uses the Triforce to help everyone survive, and another more sinister place where the people try to use it for their own personal gain. Someone from the original world has overthrown the king and has captured seven people from the other world to unlock the secrets of something called the Parallel Tower. Each of the seven people has one clue to unlock the power of this tower. Quest on! Mm, yay. We take on the role of a treasure hunter who I named Locke, and we've apparently traveled to this place to seek treasure. And how do I know that? It says it on the box. We wake up in our house and our, uh, uh, friend? Uncle? I don't know. Tells us that we're gonna break into the guardhouse tonight and find a prisoner and rescue them. Locke, this is it. This is our chance to sneak into the guardhouse. And so, he's off. He's probably dead, isn't he? Now it's up to us to find the prisoner and a way to get to the guardhouse, and this is when we figure out the most important thing about this game. This game is hard. And I, I'm not just saying the enemies are hard, I, I mean the enemies are hard. Or that maybe the game is just a step above a normal Zelda game, no! This game has to be one of the hardest games you'll ever play. You're essentially encouraged to use save states as this is a ROM hack, because this game will beat you up. And you know what? I did. I mean, I have no shame. Just look at me. Screw the physical version. It ain't worth it. It's just eye candy at this point. Mmm, and it does look good sitting over there on my shelf. This is one of those games where you question who the intended audience is before you even get into the meat of the game. Because the beginning is quite possibly one of the hardest parts of the entire game. It's totally off-putting to newcomers, and if you're not already a skilled Link to the Past player, one that knows all the little quirks of the game too, or you're just persistent, like me then you're gonna have a bad day. So we're off to explore the surrounding area, and even though we know where the guardhouse is, it's not as simple as taking the path straight to it. Luckily, we stumble upon the town pretty quickly, even though it's filled with enemies, and oh yeah, we don't have a sword. I know what you're thinking, no sword? That's gotta be some kind of mistake. Well, you're wrong. You're dead wrong. This? This is your life now. You better have a high patience level because the next hour or so, unless you know exactly where you're going, you'll be dodging almost every enemy you come across because you have no way to defend yourself. So get used to this screen. 
I mean, I guess you're not completely useless. You can throw bushes. There's only one room you can go to that consistently refuels some of your stuff, and since we have no sword in the beginning of the game, it's best to stock up on some money and bombs here. It's grinding! Everyone's favorite thing! Grinding. <sighs> Luckily, I also found out by exploring that if you travel east of Kakariko Village, you can get into the church early. And by doing this, you can grab yourself an extra heart container before you have to do all the crazy stuff. I'm also fairly certain that most of the damage thresholds on all of the enemies are increased to a ridiculous degree. And not only that, but you're constantly having to deal with groups of enemies, not just one dude. Remember, you don't have a sword, so you have to avoid all of this stuff. After wandering around for a little while, you find a cave at the base of the church, and inside, a lantern allowing us to see in dark places. But not before having to dodge around a mini boss knight chasing you down. So now we can travel to the back of Kakariko Village inside a dark cave and maneuver through that. Doing so eventually leads us to the guardhouse, where now we have to traverse an entire dungeon without our sword. This is when you truly realize that this game is going to be hard for the sake of being hard. Lots of rooms with multiple enemies that chase you, lots of spikes on the ground, and worst of all, lots of backtracking through the same areas over and over and over and over and over. Make it stop! Like I said, this game is totally unforgiving. So unforgiving, in fact, that if you die in the first dungeon, there is no continues. Oh no! You get sent all the way back to the beginning of the game. Like it wasn't hard enough already. Thank God for save states. Okay, I, I think this might be one of the only rooms I haven't checked over here. <laughs> oh, hey. I'm gonna leave now. Eventually, we make our way through the guardhouse and find our... friend. Ugh, Lonk, how did you get in here? Unarmed as well. Yeah, I'll tell you, it wasn't easy. I'm beat here, take my sword and go save the girl or whatever. Alright, cool, I guess I'll just leave you here then. You know, it doesn't even actually say that the guy specifically dies, so... I'm gonna pretend he does. No, 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 no! No, no, no! How could they do this to my friend? Finally, we get to actually defend ourselves. For the record, it's not exactly easy to use bombs when things are chasing you. You only have a limit of 10 as well, so it's obvious you're supposed to avoid things. Anyways, we fight through the rest of the dungeon and finally find Zelda in a prison cell. Thank you for saving me! I know some secrets and stuff! We escort her through the secret passage in the wine cellar and out to the church, just like we would in Link to the Past. Oh my god! We're free! We can finally go places! And we can do things! I miss doing things! Ha <laughs> ha Oh, Not so fast, fun! You forgot to go all the way back into the dungeon to get that one thing. Remember that? You thought you were done? <laughs> this guy! I forgot to mention one very important detail. None of the useful or required items are ever directly put in your path. They are hidden within the dungeons. So some of these dungeons are like mazes on crack. There there's one dungeon where the mechanic is literally falling from floor to floor. But there's like a million different possibilities and there's like seven floors. Better get lucky and choose that right combination to get to the chest. Oh boy. Oh, and don't forget that it's locked, too, so once you get there, you need the big treasure key. Not just the big key, you need a key specifically for the treasure. Which, uh, yeah, good luck with that. Sometimes items are just hidden within random chests, like the bow. The bow is just in this house, and you have to bomb your way to a secret area, and then it's in a chest in a secret area! Oh, but forgive me, I guess I should know that because you're supposed to bomb cracks in the wall, right? Everyone knows that about Zelda. Except in this game, most of the cracks on the wall are put there on purpose so that you waste your bombs. Oh, and good luck trying to find things out in the field because most of the time you're never gonna find anything and you have to walk all the way back to town. But I guess I shouldn't honestly expect anything less of a game that implements its own secret revealing button combination. A combination of buttons that, when you press them, reveals fake walls and other things that aren't really there. This is a real thing. I'm not joking. I mean, I guess it's kind of like the Lens of Truth, which is the same mechanic, but that wasn't revealed to you in such a heinously cryptic way. In fact, the only way to figure this out in-game is to talk to this one lady who says, Hi, Log. You must know the trick with me and the magic powder. Just remember, you can use it on a chicken in a house as well. Uh, what? 
I don't know if it's just me, but everything in this game doesn't make any sense. And no, it doesn't mean you should use magic powder on every chicken inside a house, which there are plenty. What she actually means is that you should use it on this one specific chicken in a specific house in another dimension. <laughs> The trick is to essentially hold the L button and X at the same time to reveal secrets. And just as a side note, once she teaches you this trick and you use it, the game essentially trolls you by putting an invisible smiley face in the room where you learn this. Yeah. That's just BM. Bad manners. After you're set free on the world, you have to figure out what you can even do. Most of the places are locked out to you because you don't have the proper equipment. You still have to go and find Sahasrila, but he's in the middle of a lake, and the only way to get to him is if he can swim. Luckily, the Zora King just loans us a scale for a small amount of rupees. And now we can learn from Sahasrila where the first spiritual stone is, which is in Naru's Bay. Okay, I got it. Fine. Off to Naru's Bay. Uh, jeez, just look at all this stuff. Oh my god, how, how is anyone supposed to get through this without taking unnecessary damage? I eventually found the big key and unlocked the big chest to find the magic hammer. But uh-oh. Puzzle. How do I get past this room? How about invisible pathways? Invisible pathways. Invisible pathways. Invisible pathways. Ah! And now we're on one of the most egregious mini-boss fights ever. I covered this in my other video a little bit, but this battle, unless you play absolutely perfectly, will destroy you. This, this right here, is a better summation of this game than I could ever come up with. In this fight alone, the health of the enemies is probably increased by 10 times the normal amount. Not only do you have to avoid taking damage because you don't have a lot of life right now, you also somehow have to manage to kill all these things. Not to mention you could very easily get knocked out of the room or fall to the floors down below. Which, you guessed it, resets the fight entirely. Even optimistically with save states, this fight took me well over 15 minutes. And not only that, but this is just the mini boss. The actual boss is literally right down the hallway. But thank god he's way easier than those guys. I did it. Now with the hammer, we have access to areas we didn't before, which means collecting much more needed heart pieces and being able to get into the second dungeon, Din's Catacombs. And the theme of this dungeon is... Fighting monsters in dark rooms! <laughs> Yay! First, we have to take on this Lamlos boss monster in a dark room while things shoot at you. Then, after getting the Goron's bracelet, we fight the real boss. Which is a Moldorm in a dark room covered in spikes. Great. The third dungeon is a ways off because nobody knows how to get there. So, this is probably when you're gonna get lost. Nothing is really spelled out for you from this point forward. Most of the hints that you'll get will come from townspeople or people you talk to early on. But once you run through those, you're pretty much on your own. Eventually, I figured out there's a pathway in the Canon Oasis that leads to some floating islands where the third dungeon lies. This dungeon's all about manipulating switches to make certain paths available to you. It's ridiculously tedious and filled with lots of backtracking. Plus, you gotta deal with these super small octopus guys constantly knocking you into these fire bars. Eventually, we get the hookshot, an invaluable item, and fight the last boss of this dungeon, the Helmasar King. But, uh-oh. There's no spiritual stone? It's, what? Ah. Wait, 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 wait. So, so, so what you're telling me is you don't get the Master Sword. You don't get to do the one thing that you do in Zelda games? I mean, I know it's there. I seen it. Nope. Turns out there might not even be a third spiritual stone. And to top it all off, Zelda's been kidnapped again. And the guy at the church died. Oh, no. Well, it looks like Zelda's been kidnapped by Dragor again. I you know, you know, the bad guy, the, g the guy, that guy. So now we have to go to Dragor's castle and try to save Princess Zelda again. Oh, no, I got to go save Princess Zelda or maybe I'll just gamble my life away instead. Hit me, chess keeper! Yeah! So you remember that room?
room you fought the wizard in in A Link to the Past? Y you know the one, this one. So imagine if you had this room and then you filled it with impassable spikes and then it had two statues on either side of the room constantly shooting fireballs at you all the while having to dodge the wizard shooting electricity at you. Cause that's this boss fight and it's not very fun. Oh my god, I finally beat him. And just like in true Link to the Past fashion, as soon as you beat this guy, you transition to the dark world of this game. Wait. So... Does that mean I have to beat seven more dungeons? Uh... No. No thank you. I mean, okay, it's, it's not that I don't enjoy the game at all. I mean, there are some aspects I actually like. It, it's more because the game is just hard for the sake of being hard. Sure, it might be a little rewarding to be thrust into a world with no direction and figure out what you have to do, or to overcome the insanely imbalanced odds against you. But I think there's just too many things in your way that make it so tedious that it's not even worth it. You're constantly having to fight bosses over and over in ridiculously and progressively unfair situations. You're always backtracking to the same places again and again. And the game literally trolls you with information and keeps useful items from you unless you consult the internet or magically stumble upon things you'd never even think of. Guys, I... I just can't do it! I love myself too much! And that's why I've been cooking for myself using Blue Apron! This seamless transition brought to you by Space Hamster. Hey. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching my video. This episode's sponsor is Blue Apron. They're a food delivery service that sends chef-designed recipes right to you. All the ingredients are proportioned for each meal so you don't waste anything. And they give you a step-by-step -step instructional recipe card that shows you how to cook the recipes along the way. It's so easy, even I can do it. I've never actually used Blue Apron before now, but even just after the first box of food they send over, I'm pretty convinced of the quality that you get. Everything they send is fresh on delivery, and there's so much variety with each package that you get. This first one that I had contains seared steak, masala spiced chicken, and seared barramundi. And even though I was a little intimidated having never cooked some of this stuff before, it actually turned out great. And I definitely learned a lot along the way. <laughs> I I've always been the type of person who does actually like learning new recipes, but with a job like YouTube, I'm pretty much always working. But this really does help by giving you exactly what you need, no hassles, all the ingredients are proportioned out for you for each recipe, and then you just follow the recipe card step by step. So if you're interested and you want to sign up, be sure to use the link in the description down below because the first 100 people who sign up using that link will get their first three meals for free. So check it out, highly recommend it, cook some stuff, do some things, and thank you for watching. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching the video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Gotta give a shout out to those artists who've been sending all the art. You guys have a skill that I wish I had. And as always, if you liked the video, be sure to click that like button and subscribe to the channel for more. Uh, uh, be sure to brush your teeth and comb your hair. All that stuff. Uh oh, and if you want to watch more Zelda stuff, I got another Zelda video for you right there. Zelda bootlegs. And why not go and check out Zelda Month over on Peanut Butter Gamer's channel? He was in this video. Remember that? And as always, see you guys on the next episode. And until then, bye.